after years and years of discontent, England finally make it to a major final, their first since 1966, the first ever European Championship final. England beat Denmark in extra time and now earn a ticket to face Italy in the final game on Sunday. We got James Mensch to discuss and, of course, our first gut instinct about the Euro 2020 final. Kego Lasso begins right now. And exhale. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Kego Lasso. What a win. England beat Denmark. And for the first time since 1966, England make it into a final of a major tournament. They are in their first ever European Championship final. Unbelievable. An extra time win thanks to a penalty scored. Uh, well, it was a missed penalty and then rebounded by Harry Kane, of course. But we will talk about the game, of course. And of course, we welcome James Bench. James Bench, how are you, my friend? I'm, I'm shattered. Um, I'm, a, I'm feeling really, really emotional. Um, which, you know, I know that nothing's been won yet, but um, in all my lifetime, I have never seen this. I think there have been moments where you started to believe in this country that maybe we would never see uh, it coming home. Um, and like Americans get used to hearing it and get used to us not giving a rat's ass when you complain about it. This was, uh, I mean, it was a real ringer of a game. It was it was tough, but actually I came away with it from it with even more admiration for this England team than I had after the games against Germany, after the game against Ukraine. Um, huge admiration for Denmark as well, I am certain, and we should probably apologise from the outset, that they will get a bit lost in this in this pod with an Englishman and a guy in a Jack Grealish shirt. Um, <laughs> yeah. And don't forget, I was born in England and grew up in England. So, you know, it's, I'm sorry, Denmark, <laughs> it's not gonna. <laughs> it was a spectacular display of composure. It, this was as, um, you know, and for England as well, this is England who so often they seem to be their own worst enemy and everyone in the country, I think, you know, certainly the sense I got was everyone, started panicking as soon as Denmark's press really kicked into gear. Everyone except like those players, those English players and, um, and Gareth Southgate, what an occasion. I'm so excited for, for Sunday. I mean, I, of course I care if England win, but you know, this is, this is hero stuff. This is the most amazing achievement by an English football team in my lifetime. And yeah, it makes you really proud to have followed this team. I have to say. Well, this is why we wanted you on today, my friend, because I really wanted to get that emotion from you. Uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, I, I Actually, can, can I can I interrupt? I was I was mulling whether to share this story, and who knows, we might edit it out. Um, three years ago, um, I mean, I, I'm pretty open about this, but I, you know, kind of suffered with depression for much of my life. Um, three years ago was pretty much my lowest ebb. Um, almost exactly three years ago, around the World Cup time it would be sort of disingenuous to suggest that England, the England national team at the world cup brought me out of it uh, because, you know, one thing doesn't change that. But what I think it did was it, um, I, I, that communal experience is, can be so hard to find, I think in, in modern society, particularly this year, but you know, even for me, you know, for me personally three, three years ago, but I think for all of us, it's hard to find something to gravitate around. And um, I think this England team have given you that. They've given you a, a group of young men that you really like see something that you're incredibly proud uh, about feeling English. And I think that's a hard thing to find, to be honest, particularly over the last few years. Um, I think they're everything you aspire to be in, in terms of the way they play football and the way they conduct themselves. Um, and for me personally, in that time, you know, that, that gave me something to be really excited and, and happy about at a time when it was you know, incredibly hard to find that. And when you kind of were thinking about genuinely thinking, what is there to live for? I know this is a bit of a tangent for our normal listeners, but um, I feel compelled to share it because, you know, this England team does just fills you up with, with pride and with delight and, and joy. And I think it's a really special time to be a follower of football. If you're English, um, say it again, 
it is a really special time, no doubt, for Danish fans as well. And by God, they were a fantastic team. And I wish there could be three teams in the final because Denmark were amazing. But yeah, I didn't know if I was going to share that. I've been mulling whether or not to talk about that. But um, yeah, thank you, England, for helping me. Well, James, I, I got to say on behalf of uh, our audience, I, I, I'm i so happy you shared that. I, I'm so thankful. It was real heartfelt words. And honestly, it's something that um, we need to hear more of because I, I not from you. I'm just saying that I think it's, it's so refreshing and so beautiful and sad and happy and everything. And it's everything what a human being is. I have my own relationship with these situations. And what you just shared there to me is, is amazing because that this is what this game does to us sometimes. And this is what sometimes also the national team does. And uh, what you said was beautiful, man. And um, I'm so happy for you. I'm, I'm so happy for every, anybody that can connect to that, you know, from the little boy that, grows up in London and looks up to Marcus Rashford after everything he's done, um, you know, to, you know, anybody that's a Tottenham fan that loves Harry Kane and sees his struggles and how he's overcome them, like just everything. And, and this game, football, can do that to you. It can give you those feelings that nothing else can do. And today was a special moment for that. And I think especially the fact that it was, you know, Raheem Sterling was the real star. Yeah. And he has been through a career like no other You know, we have seen some of the horrible stuff written about him and how he's responded kind of in every way. And, and by the way, yeah, he dived for the penalty. He will, uh, you know, or whatever. He certainly went down easily, but like, my God, what a, what a footballer and um, player of the tournament for me. Oh man. Yeah. I I mean, and it's unbelievable because he's been through so much, as you said, not just from like a performance perspective, but the racial abuse from like, you know, certain media outlets and everything he's had to go through. And even uh, before the kickoff whistle of the first game, there were question marks whether he should be even a part of this team. Mm. And look what he's done. Look what he's achieved. It's, it's tremendous. And it's not that dissimilar to the point that you began with, James, with your story, with your beautiful uh, reflections, which is about, you know, we've gone through so much right? A pandemic, fight for social justice so much. And, and sometimes we forget just how fragile we are. And this England team really have come together under the leadership of Gareth Southgate. And it's amazing. Yes, Raheem Sterling, for me, player of the tournament. Absolutely. In- incredible oh, stuff. Um, so go ahead. I don't know what you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I mean, I have to say, I, 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 I mean, are we, let's keep saying this. Denmark, fantastic and i think but by the way james and our producer was we're talking our producer lisa was thanking james for for the for the message and james is like feel free to cut it we're not gonna cut it out it's like beautiful we want to hear it my <laughs> goodness go ahead james continue oh yeah i mean i just wanted to say like you know we should talk about the football because i think particularly denmark tactically really nailed this early on I loved that that brilliant press. The way that they, they and they really did get what you're going to do here is you're going to kind of force England out wide. It was both the sort of the way in which Denmark won the game or might have won the game and the way they lost it because in the end England kept going out wide and eventually they found that space in behind Vestergaard which was where both the goals came from. I think Vestergaard just maybe just lacks that little yard of pace and Mela was so under pressure to to bomb on um and, and to try and do something in attacking terms that that that's where it came from. But really, I thought that the early on, they were the only team I thought that rattled England in possession and rattled that back five. Dem- Declan Rice in particular, who grew into the game, but he, he was, he was iffy early on. He, he was vulnerable to the, to the press. He kept going backwards and you could see Jordan Pickford was, I, I kind of thought Denmark with that pressure, they, I don't know whether they knew that it would bring out that nervy side in, in Pickford, but he felt that pressure. And he, yeah. I think more than any player, you know, obviously he, he's done fantastically to just keep all the way through until the semifinals to keep his, his goal unblemished. But, you know, I think that pressure showed in a lot of ways. Interesting, there was a uh, one, one, someone I follow on Twitter, I can't remember who, pointed out a really good point about how uh, John Harrison, about how for that goal, Pickford got his dive all wrong, diving with his weaker hand. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that the goalkeepers are drilled day in, day out. You don't make this mistake. But I think just the pressure, not only of the occasion, but of what Denmark were doing 
to England really got to them for a while. And again, it was a hell of a shot too. I mean, that the power behind it, and it swerved a little bit as well. So he, like Pickford kind of got this. But yeah, absolutely. It, listen, one of the things that I said on CBS Sports HQ today was if Denmark were to win here, the first thing they needed to do was make it incredibly frustrating for England. Like just be make it so sticky and annoying and be in their face. And most importantly, do whatever you can to score first. Obviously, you always want to be the team and wants to score first, but for Denmark, especially so, so today, because you would rattle them because the strength in England not conceding a goal was also in a way a weakness because you were like, how are they going to react after conceding a goal? And obviously we knew what happened right after, but Denmark started this very well, made it so frustrating for England. Really, really frustrating, really energetic. Um, it was kind of everything we've come to, to view this Denmark team as, um, a comp composed unit that has got a plan, um, really knows how to unsettle teams, both at set pieces. I mean, and, you know, that was it. It was, it was they were forcing mistakes. I think in the end, what we'll look back as on as the quality showed and England are just a slightly better team man for man. Um, and, you know, that that was really apparent in that that goal because I didn't feel like anything was on the cards, but Harry Kane does what Harry Kane does really well. And actually, I thought it'd be, you know, it worked a lot in this game was that dropping into space that yeah. everyone was going, he can't do that. He needs to stop doing that. But maybe it's just having had six weeks probably now with these with these guys and lots of minutes. He knew when to make that pass for Saka's great run. I thought I, I was really impressed. And I know this is my Arsenal hat on. I was really impressed by how that was a bad first touch by Saka, but it, it didn't knock him off his stride straight across goal. And um, no, he was great. Yeah, I mean, it was his uh, cross that, that caused the own goal and Raheem Sterling's pressure, of course. All right. So then it goes one all. It's England uh, even more dominating in the second half. I mean, Denmark were like their tank was out. And uh, the longer extra time went, the more I thought we don't want this. England fans do not want this to go to penalties because, you know, you have to finish it right here. And it, Denmark had no answers. They, they put two up front. They brought in Poulsen earlier on, of course. And, you know, the midfield was a little bit op more open. And then James Bench, Raheem Sterling dazzles inside the box, causes mayhem. And yes, a, a very harsh penalty. Talk to me about it. What do you think? I don't really care. <laughs> I'm not bothered. I did, uh, you know, it's the Stephen A thing, isn't it? Look, I'm here to... Ain't I'm no here way! <laughs> We don't care. <laughs> we don't. And look, there ain't no way a penalty like that should be given at Euro 2020. But it was. And that's all that counts. I mean, well, again, you know, there were other moments where England's pressure didn't quite pay off. If you occupy the final third as consistently as England do, you know, and draw opponents out, you know, you're not only putting pressure on the opposition most of all, but you're, you're putting referees in that position where they've got to be live to every, every knock, every dash, you know, there was the, there was the cane thing earlier in, um, earlier in the, or late in the, the second half, wasn't there where he, I, I thought it probably wasn't a penalty, but also it's the sort where if, I mean, looked like Norgard had got the ball first, but if the referee had said, no, I think that was VAR wouldn't have overturned it the same as uh, how VAR basically said, I, I would imagine they looked at that and said, it's probably not, but it's not clear cut enough to overturn. Well, that's um, the thing. And that's the point. And I think that's the important part that everybody needs to know. Like there needed to be a clear and obvious reason to overturn the decision. And there wasn't, there wasn't. It, okay. Should you give that in, instinctively? No, but there wasn't a, a clear reason for the for VAR to overturn it. So, and listen, over the course of the game, England deserved that win. I, you know, I think I don't think any Danish fan can deny that, right? Like that England completely were looking for that second goal. Was it a horrifically harsh penalty? Yes, but, you know. You remember that Robbie Fowler penalty when uh, Liverpool won a penalty against yep. Arsenal? Yeah. Robbie Fowler was like, this isn't a penalty. I, part of me was like, is that why Harry Kane took his penalty so badly? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe he was just like, well, look, you know, here I get to show that it, it, you know, I didn't deserve this penalty, but also if Schmeichel spills the rebound, I'll, I'll, I'll knock it in. I mean, I thought Kane was excellent. He was, was excellent. He, he was excellent. He was doing so many little things that you need to watch once again, not just obviously, uh, you know, scoring, but, 
you know, that cross that nearly made it to Raheem Sterling early on, you know, that usually we see so much with Tottenham when Son is at the end of it, you know, but also getting out of sticky situations and holding that ball and just, you know, making the play longer for England to contain. It's just an unbelievable performance from him. Him, Raheem Sterling, and I thought Kyle Walker was amazing. <laughs> Kyle Walker was... I, it is a blessing. It must change the way you set up your defense entirely. I can only speculate here, but you know, so you can play a really high line with fairly slow players like um, Stones and um, Aguirre, because yeah. you just trust that Walker will get every ball. I mean, there was that moment early on, wasn't there, where you go, oh, Damsgaard's away. I Maybe mean, two or three moments where it looked like Damsgaard was away, and thirty-one-year-old Kyle Walker. It didn't look like he was breaking a sweat. And then he did it an extra time. And you're just like, what's going on? <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right. I want to quickly. I, mean, I gave Sterling a 10, but I could easily have done the same for Walker as well. He was. Born. Well, it wouldn't be uh, much of an argument for me, to be honest. I think Raheem Sterling was definitely like a 10 and Carl Walker is like a nine and a half. I just, he, he was fantastic. Let's talk a little bit, just finally to wrap things up. Uh, and then we'll get your quick thoughts on the on the final. Just Denmark, uh, what a tournament. I mean, you know, it began with a tragedy and Christian Eriksen's energy and his aura kind of pushed him through all the way. The fact that they made it to the semifinals to me is unbelievable. They're a very good team. You named them a dark yeah, horse. Yeah, not unbelievable to me. <laughs> not unbelievable to you. James Bench did call them a dark horse, right? But, you know, they, they did an amazing thing in this tournament and it was after the effects of a horrific moment where one of their players had to literally be resuscitated and, and look where they are. And so, you know, Kasper Schmeichel and co should be very, very proud. A very good Danish performance in this tournament. I completely agree with you. And I think, well, it's, it's really difficult to know what might have happened kind of in every, in positive and, you know, negative ways on the pitch had Christian Eriksen been with his team because, you know, the, the, that was fuel. It was real fuel. You know, I mean, I remember sitting down writing the news, news, art newses after the, um, after the event and you kind of wanted to put in, and I remember Casper Schmeichel saying it, we're going to win the tournament for Ericsson. Yeah. And you know, it, it's hard it, at that moment. It's really hard to dissociate the much more important matters with the football stuff, but you from, there were moments where you kind of thought, yeah, this, this feels like, uh, a th- destiny this feels like a, a story that that merits the ending but you know equally you know if this team just didn't have Christian Eriksen before or after the tournament a wonderful collection of footballers I mean if we're talking about rivals for, to Sterling for player of the tournament Joachim Mela, fantastic yep Pierre-Emil Hoiberg you know you go, go and look at some of the numbers he's had for shot creating actions and chances created I don't know what they're doing to him at Tottenham and, you know, fair play. He's, he's good at what he does at Tottenham, but this guy, he was like, was like Javi mixed with Roy Keane. It was, <laughs> he was, he was, that's a really good way to describe him. Yeah, absolutely. A wonderful, wonderful, um, wonderful team. I think they'll, you know, I think they'll be back. There's good. Well, they're going to be a nightmare at the world cup. I tell you right now, if they, you know, essentially when, when it had, they're, they're, they're very good and, they're a very good team. You mentioned them at Dark Horse and rightly so. I mean, only four players in that squad played in the Danish league without giving any disrespect to the Danish league. There's a reason why this Danish side is so good and made it to the semifinal. So well done. All right. So before we leave, James Bench, Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern, Italy against England. What a final. What, what do you think? Just your, your gut instinct right now. I'm happier it's Italy than Spain. Yeah, with England, I think Spain would would could well have, you know, just passed this, and Italy could as well because their midfield's fantastic. But um, I think Spain would have been a tougher match, just a bit more capable of passing this team into into the ground. You, you look at this, and you know this is a contest that's going to be decided down the flanks. Shaw and Walker, can they? You know, and there were moments early on where they looked a little uncomfortable about when to go and press the Danish wing-backs. Will they have difficulty against Chiesa uh, or Berardi? Both of them deserve to play. Uh, and um, Insigne, equally. One thing that I, uh, one thing that I've been thinking, and I'm sure it'll be in some piece I write before the final, I think this could be a great game for Harry Kane to do what he likes doing at Tottenham and drop deep. We saw this with um, Spain playing Danny Olmo and not really playing a centre-forward. 
Yeah, I'm hand dropping deep, right? And Jorginho yeah. feeling out of spot. Yeah. In the end, you know, this is, Italy defense is wonderful. Great goalkeeper in behind, but if you can find space, there are a few teams that I would trust to exploit it more than than England. It's going to be tight, tactical. Um, it's gonna. I, I can't wait for the memes. Um, <laughs> but it, you know, I just above all else, you know, I I think this was the real. Of course. Of course, you want England to win, but it's such a huge achievement to get this far, to, to get back to a final for the first time in, you know, not just my lifetime, but I was sat there with my with my mum who said I was not allowed to file the top three pars of my piece until full time. She said, don't jinx it. Um, I just think, you know, you know, my mum doesn't remember what it was like England playing in a World Cup final. Now, no one I know, uh, you know, very few people have experienced this. It's going to be fantastic and to have it at Wembley you know I do think that will make the difference and ultimately maybe that you know England supporters are the 12th man and I'm starting to hope and believe I think it's going to be close I don't know what your thoughts are but I think England might just have this no, I'm going, God instinctive, I'm going for an England win for, for many of the reasons that you said. I think if this would have been Spain, honestly, this would have been a way tougher game. I just think that Italy, show, you listen, Italy absolutely rightfully deserved to be in this final. Spain played a better game during the, the course of the game because they were trying to break down. I think just what England have to worry about is the counterattacking dangers of Chiesa on one side and Senia on the other one, et cetera, et cetera. But I still think that England have enough to do this. But James Bench, you know, you predicted, you said, you know, you've, you've been going against England, rightfully so, for this psychological thing. So you, you have to do it again, surely, for this oh, final. Absolutely. Right. I think, I think clearly what my problem has been, I mean, you know, I've predicted two of the games on HQ and they've both been nervy England wins because I predicted tight wins for Germany and Denmark. So as such, I'm going 4-0 Italy. You know, let's get this done. <laughs> That'll be 4-0 England then. I'm, I'm going for any Italy hammering. There you go. I'm just worried that Fab's going to double jinx me and come on one of your pods and predict a massive England win. Well, yes, yeah, so that's the generation. problem because he's also very hesitant as well about, he wasn't very optimistic about Italy. Yeah, even now he's still, you know, he's doing exactly what you're doing. So maybe uh, we'll have to have both of you on and see what happens. <laughs> be my pleasure <laughs> James Bench enjoy the rest of your evening England beat Denmark they're in the final Italy England Euro 2020 final Sunday 3pm Eastern James thanks so much my man thank you <laughs> Hey, everybody. I want to thank James Bench for joining me today. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Kegolasso Pod. Please listen to us on Apple Podcasts, as well on Spotify, Stitcher, CBS Sports, and your CBS Sports app. We're on YouTube as well. You can watch every video, youtube.com forward slash Kegolasso. And please vote for us on the People's Choice Podcast Awards. If you just follow us on Twitter or read the title description as well, when you listen to the spot, you can go to that link and just go to the sports category. And right at the bottom, right there, we are Que Golazo, only a 10th month in existence. And we have been nominated for a pod. Please vote for us. Your support really means a lot. Have a great, great rest of your day. And we look ahead to a fantastic weekend of international action. (laughs) 